So how is it that we can best hope to know ourselves as individuals? We live short lives with fallible minds prone to delusion. It's so easy to deceive ourselves with regards to our true nature. We can come to identify ourselves with the things we possess, or ephemeral beliefs we hold, or arbitrary lines drawn on a map, or our man-made political or cultural labels. At the end of the day, none of this is deeply real, because none of it is innate, coming from the inside out. The blood flowing through our veins is real. The genetic code that informs every cell in our body how to best express itself is something we inherit, something within us. When seeking to understand oneself, looking back at one's life can be informative. But this is a short period of time, replete with personal errors and missteps, and even more importantly, liable to be misunderstood or misinterpreted. But what if we'd lived 1,000 lives before, in slightly different manifestations and projections, amidst countless environments and conditions across the span of time? This is the power of history. The blood that flows through your veins has lived before, countless times before. An understanding of our roots helps inform us of who we are and how to best be and grow. Cut off from this understanding, we can't help but live in confusion and anxiety. It's a state of true ignorance. There's nothing more informative than an accurate picture of history. It's not only a record of our own personal journey, but of the intersection and intertwining of all journeys in a multitude of unique circumstances. Obtaining a totality of perfect context here, if such a thing were possible, would lead to an unprecedented level of understanding of ourselves and our reality. Historical context is crucial, and without it, we're very much unmoored beings. We live in the age of the atomized individual, an age in which we're taught that we're all blank slates and fresh starts, entirely shaped by our environmental impulses. And it's true that your every external impulse does shape the expression of the true you within, but at our deepest levels, the blood flowing through our veins and the genes we were gifted with still remain the central pillar around which all else rotates, the pillar that contains all possible expressions within it. Understanding this central pillar is profoundly important. I've begun this video series to help counteract what I see as an attempt at obfuscating, mischaracterizing, or destroying our understanding of our collective central pillar. The subversion of our conception of history and of our historical roots. What scant history we're now taught is often dull and lifeless, a recitation of dry facts and figures by professors who feel no connection to the subject matter. A tedious sermon, often delivered in a nasal monotone. But it's more than just poorly delivered. It's often wildly dishonest, misinformative, robbing us of that power that comes from true understanding. One can't properly orient and direct their future unless they understand their past. And a true understanding isn't communicated by the clinical and detached memorization of trivia and pointless details, but in the deeper understanding and feeling the collective experiences of their ancestors. This will be the most important video I've made thus far, as well as the most daunting, difficult, controversial, and dangerous to my channel. I've long asked myself the question, how should one best act when they come to know important truths against which the majority of the population has been deeply prejudiced, programmed to not only reject, but to misunderstand the intent behind their voicing? We're now in such dire straits that the best path forward is clear. Regardless of the cost of doing so, these truths must be told. We need to realize our hand has been forced. And if we don't drop our pathological and suicidal altruism, 
and begin to courageously speak truths once again. It's our own future generations that'll pay the price for our cowardice and dishonesty. Over time, I'll certainly receive a backlash from several subsets of people, and I fully understand it. For years, they've been exposed to the most backward pseudoscience, wearing the mask of legitimate thought, on the topics of race, human history, genetics, human migrations. They've been subjected to the most intellectually lazy lumping together of race realism with racial hatred. Most of us recognize the subversion of our financial and political systems, our media and entertainment. When I began to see similar red flags with regards to the teaching of history, I became a skeptic overnight. I should clarify, I became a true skeptic in the proper definition of the word, which meant I became the polar opposite of those who call themselves skeptics today the type who've never met a conventional narrative pushed by the status quo that they didn't unthinkingly embrace and seek to defend with dogmatic fervor. Over time, I felt unable to trust any source of information implicitly, because even those with genuine intent can be hoodwinked by reading the materials of those with less genuine intent. So I instead sought to immerse myself only in root historical sources, meaning the older the better, and the more first-hand the better. To this day, I believe this to be the best approach to a landscape so rife with subversion and sloppy thinking. I've always found it amusing how many conventional thinkers approach conspiracies or any nefarious actions behind the scenes as a virtual impossibility. They basically trust our system and our media, and make the argument that in any significant conspiracy, someone would have to talk, and thus the entire house of cards would fall. This is an idea so absurd it deserves its own video, but to briefly summarize, not only does our controlled press routinely ignore whistleblowers or inconvenient truth-tellers of every stripe to avoid biting the hand that feeds them, but this whistleblower conception isn't how such things actually transpire in the real world. The vast majority of people involved in any conspiracy are completely oblivious to the role they play within it. I believe this holds true for most of those currently working together to subvert our understanding of history. There was a quote I recently posted to Twitter that I haven't been able to stop thinking about since, as it so perfectly illustrates how most conspiratorial subversion actually takes place over time. Quote, the smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but allow very lively debate within that spectrum, even encourage the more critical and dissident views. That gives people the sense that there's free thinking going on, while all the time the presuppositions of the system are being reinforced by the limits put on the range of the debate. Think about this quote in the context of race. We no longer allow positive things to be said about those of an Indo-European background as a group. And simultaneously, we not only allow but encourage negative things. The opposite is true for every other group. And these are the guidelines within which all related discussions are currently carried out. The same holds true for all relevant publications, and even all research and analysis because these are all, at the end of the day, controlled by money. If we start out with the foundational premise that there are no differences between peoples in any innate ability or skill set, this means any piece of the historical record that seems to highlight these differences must be misinformed, or a product of racism, and must be reinterpreted accordingly, to allow for a more just and equitable narrative. Additionally, those best suited to this new religion and its morality, meaning those most, quote, anti-racist, end quote, in their outlook, will most swiftly rise through the ranks in their respective fields, into positions of ever greater influence and reach. In other words, no vast conspiracy was needed to completely toss out everything we knew about race and history prior to World War II, and replace it with a speculative hodgepodge of nonsense. 
This happened organically, as useful idiots and willing tools pursued their own best interests. If you want a promotion, regurgitate Jared Diamond's offensively stupid ideas. If you'd like to be fired, ally yourself with the consensus opinion of practically every major thinker prior to 1945. So which is more likely? Were all of these great pre-World War II thinkers from nations all across the world vicious racists driven by hatred, who simply wanted to feel better about themselves, causing them to pen book after book of misinformation? Or is our current politically correct atmosphere preventing honest discussion on controversial topics? The answer to this question is obvious. And yet most of us have no idea of just how bad things have become on this front. Nationalists in places like India and Egypt, to give just two examples of many, have taken over their own academic fields, with help of the usual subversives, and are largely promoted on the basis of just how effectively they're able to dismiss the contributions of the Indo-European element, and attribute all former greatness of their regions to themselves. Various organizations have been created to lock down important sites and control archaeological research and the processing of all artifacts. Back in America, the Smithsonian has a nasty habit of misplacing countless artifacts that don't cleanly fit the conventional model of history, never to be seen again. And the youth are taught that it's practically heroic to tear down statues of white historical figures of old. In Sweden, the new Minister for Culture of African descent has ordered Viking artifacts to be melted down and recycled. On every front, from every angle, history is being destroyed and rewritten. This has been maddening to watch, and I've not even scratched the surface with what I just laid out. It's clear to me why this is happening. Since I began the process of immersion in the most trustworthy historical records I've been able to find over the years, I kept coming back to the thought that a truly honest and objective historical account, if written in our age, would appear as the single most racist book ever authored, assuming one defines the word racist to be referring to a belief in differences in ability or achievement, as opposed to racial hatred. The same forces that so effectively hijacked academia post-World War II did so to impose a new worldview, a new framework. One could even call it a religion. And nothing threatens this construct more than hard historical truths. These topics are so subverted, so deeply muddied and confused, that to find our way out of this mess we need to engage in efficient detective work and only present those ideas and concepts we're most confident in to improve the signal-to-noise ratio. So my first goal is to provide the broad strokes and then work to fill in the finer points over time. I feel like I know much more than I'm voicing just yet, and I expect this will be the first in a series of videos on the topic, but always I'll be striving to only speak where I have a great deal of confidence. We live in an age of information overload, and we desperately need quality, not quantity. So here's my attempt at that. Those currently dominating the historical narrative are isolationist, as opposed to diffusionist, in their perspective, meaning they believe most nations and cultures, especially those separated by large bodies of water, to have been incapable of contact and interchange with one another. This foundational premise has helped to sabotage our understanding of our past, and is provably false. We find traces of tobacco and cocaine and cannabis in the fair-haired mummies of the pharaohs and Scythians, materials that would have been impossible to come by without overseas connections. We find similar architecture in these supposedly completely disconnected civilizations, such as pyramids and mound graves. We find numerous stories, especially in South America, of bearded and fair-skinned men coming across the water to bestow knowledge and civilizational gifts. And we find the swastika everywhere, a symbol sacred to the Indo-Europeans and used more prominently than any other 
It's now fallen victim to our politically correct rewrite of world history. And like so many similar things, can't be discussed with intellectual honesty any longer. Earliest depictions stretch back to at least 4000 BC and seem to be a hallmark of a relatively singular people and culture with traces left on every continent as a testament to their reach. This isolationist perspective was one of the forks in the road where our understanding of the past started to go so far astray. It's difficult to overstate just how interconnected history indicates that nations and empires actually were. From the dawn of the historical record in approximately 3000 BC onward, viewing Egypt and Sumer and ancient India and Greece and Persia as completely unique and separate entities, supposedly emerging completely independently with virtually no genetic or cultural or trade connections, has caused us to build our picture of history on a foundation of sand, destined to never quite add up or make sense. Our collective understanding of history is now so poor that many believe things like the Germanic peoples having just sort of milled around in the forests for millennia, that the Vikings were savages, and that the Italic and Celtic and Germanic peoples are not only fundamentally separate and distinct from one another, but have little connection to the mounted Aryan element that roamed and subjugated large swaths of the Middle East, the steppes, and moved down into Greece and India and into East Asia. These were all actions of a single larger family, and we fail to recognize this at our own peril, becoming prey to divide and conquer nonsense, costly infighting between brothers and cousins. Thor Heyerdahl is an example of a man who refused to do anything but follow the evidence wherever it led, undaunted by those critics taught to search only for evidence supporting conventional theories. I think that uh, from personal experience, and I have a good deal of experience when it comes to traveling on the ocean with primitive crowds, we do a tremendous error, uh, error by closing our eyes to the fact that there is no distance from Africa to America, no distance from America to Polynesia, if you travel the correct way. And in the Indian Ocean, you can travel one way half the year, the other way the other half the year. So there too, we from, the time, yes, from the time man had a boat that would float, the ocean is a convener and not an iceberg. Exactly. Well, I often point that out in my books. Oceans are, are highways, not barriers right. to travel. Right. And the easiest way to get from one continent to another is not to, to walk, right. you know, all, all over the, the place, but just to go The barriers walk. are the deserts and the jungles and the mountains. And the, and the hostile tribes exactly. who are going to attack you. Exactly. The credentialed, quote, experts, end quote, in the field continued to insist travel across large bodies of water before relatively recent times was an impossibility, despite the massive evidence indicating otherwise. Being the epitome of a courageous Norseman, he finally grew tired of the armchair speculators claiming a crossing from South Africa to Polynesia couldn't be done, and with five fellow Norsemen as crew, they simply built a raft using indigenous materials and methods of the ancient era and set off. The expedition secretary, Gerd Vold, was given a bouquet of sunflowers as a reminder that Kontiki was the name of the sun god in the ancient Inca legends. According to Peruvian tradition, a nation with a white king was said to have ruled the land before the Incas took over. His head is hewn in prehistoric stone statues high up in the Andes. One of these provided a model for the head on our sail. The last we hear of Kontiki in these ancient legends is that he was banished from Peru and disappeared with his people across the Pacific. In the Polynesian islands too, people speak of the great Tiki, who brought their ancestors to the islands. We were now going to follow in his footsteps. On April the 28th, 1947, the pelicans, for the first time for hundreds of years, were startled at the sight of a balsa raft heading for the open sea. And 101 days later, arrived at their destination, safe and sound, having crossed an entire ocean. 
We also have evidence of tobacco and cocaine in the red and blonde haired mummies of the pharaohs discovered over recent decades. Materials that wouldn't have been available without long distance trade networks. Though status quo academics circled the wagons and loudly proclaimed the tests to be mistakes or outright frauds, and after completely destroying the career of the poor woman who made the initial discoveries, the results have since been confirmed and reconfirmed. In North America, there were countless stories of American colonists unearthing bodies of a Caucasoid skull shape, many extremely tall, and several having natural red hair remaining intact. Despite hundreds of pictures, journal entries, and newspaper articles, little evidence exists today, as the vast majority of these finds were shipped to the Smithsonian, who managed to, quote, misplace or lose track of them. In South America, we have the cloud people of the Chachapoyas culture, as well as the Paracas skull finds, both of which show fair hair of a thinner type than the Native Americans, and an obviously Caucasoid skull shape. In fact, the Paracas skulls have since become famous everywhere but academic circles, who avoid them like the plague due to their elongated shape. Conventional academics attempted to claim this was a result of head binding, which seems to be their go-to excuse in such cases. But this is obviously false. Not only do they lack what's called a parietal suture and have a much bigger form and magnum than traditional skulls, but binding can only alter the shape of a skull. It can't increase the size and internal volume, not to mention it leaves several telltale signs. Genetic testing also has linked them to haplogroups found in Europe today. And interestingly, these same academics that so brazenly attempt to claim all elongated skulls are the result of binding, rarely give an opinion on why any people would engage in this behavior in the first place as we know some natives did in South America. Might the simplest explanation be the correct one, and that they did so for the same reasons many wealthy ancient Greeks and many modern Europeans and Americans of just a few hundred years ago would apply cosmetics to make their skin appear more white, or for the same reason many dye their hair blonde or wear colored contacts, or the same reason cosmetic surgery to produce a rounder eye shape is so popular across Asia today? Cosmetic changes of almost any type are usually done to emulate our ideal of the moment. The only frame through which headbinding makes sense to me is if it were to emulate this ruling caste with a different skull shape to the native population. A conquistador named Cieza de Leon remarked that among the indigenous Peruvians, the Chachapoyas were unusually fair-skinned and famously beautiful. Quote, they are the whitest and most handsome of all the people that I have seen in the Indies, and their wives were of unrivaled beauty." End quote. The Chachapoyas were buried in sarcophagi sculpted with obvious European features, which bear an intriguing resemblance to those of another location with legends of a fair-skinned people in ancient times, Easter Island. For further evidence that true history is not how it's being currently portrayed, I introduce you to the Asaberg Buddha found in Sweden. Determined to have been placed in a Viking burial around 830 AD. Interestingly, this item wasn't imported, but rather created locally. So, might Buddhism and the Buddha himself be traced to Indo-European peoples? The answer is a resounding yes, and this is yet another topic worthy of its own video someday. Here we have the first visual depiction of the Buddha ever discovered. Look closely at the facial features, the clothing and hairstyles, and the artistic style itself. Stitch clothing, the draped um, clothing on the lower body and the upper body. He has his hair up in a top knot, um, and he's also carrying um, a small water pot in his hand there. On the other side, you have Indra, and he's dressed in the clothing of um, a prince. He's wearing a turban, he has his draped clothing on again, and he has armbands, bracelets, and he is praying to the Buddha there. It's really not clear who this figure is. It's generally assumed that he's a bodhisattva, and possibly Maitreya, which is the bodhisattva of the future. But who knows, one day we might be able to identify him. To 
to quote one of my favorite creators in our community, very Indo-European. The Buddha was from the Shakya clan, also called the Sakya or Sakai, which most intellectually honest scholars tie to the linguistic root from which Scythian and ultimately Saxon is derived. Even before the time of the Buddha, an Indo-European people we now call the Tocharians had pushed all the way to China, at minimum, leaving traces and mummified remains in the Tarim Basin, among other locations, which China doesn't allow outsiders to explore, just as they deny the existence of what seems to be ancient pyramidal structures, and have planted trees over them in attempts to hide their outlines. These mummies were found with tartan print clothing, similar to the type you might find in Scotland. A specialist in ancient DNA, Victor Mayer, states, quote, The new finds are also forcing a re-examination of the old Chinese books that describe historical or legendary figures of great height, with deep-set blue or green eyes, long noses, full beards, and red or blonde hair. Scholars have traditionally scoffed at these accounts, but it now seems they may be accurate, end quote. Genghis Khan and his successor sons were also spoken of as having red hair and blue or gray eyes. According to the Persian historian Abul Ghassi, the tribal clan to which Temujin belonged were known as the Borchakon, or the gray-eyed men. There's growing evidence that an Indo-European element may have even pushed into Japan and the Koreas, inspiring Bushido culture. This subsumed genetic remnant may explain the differences in facial features between the classes that still exist in these nations today, including the increased prevalence of thick beards, narrower bridged noses, and fairer skin amongst the Daimo class in Japan. The Aryan invaders that swept into India in earnest in approximately 1500 to 1700 BC and established that hallmark Indo-European tradition of the caste system worshipped Indra as their highest god, whom historians long thought to be equivalent to the Norse Thor. The Rig Veda, one of the earliest written documents in the world, repeatedly refers to Indra's yellow hair and beard, and speaks of him fighting what are called the dark and swarthy adversaries to force them to bow to law and order, and, quote, preserve the Aryan color among several other passages that'd be deemed so racist in the modern atmosphere that this video might be removed if I quoted them verbatim. As India began its decline, the Bhagavad Gita was pinned, stating, out of the corruption of women proceeds the confusion of castes. Out of the confusion of castes proceeds the loss of memory. Out of the loss of memory proceeds the loss of understanding. And out of this, all evil. King Darius, of the Achaemenid ruling family in Persia, went out of his way to claim to be an Aryan of the Aryan race, and like the surrounding Thracians, Scythians, Sumerians, and others, most of whom would later migrate northwest into Europe, these were Aryan peoples of the Indo-European cultural and linguistic root. So where was the home base of this lineage is the all-important question asked by so many over the past several decades. I do have some theories on this front, theories I hope to share as soon as I'm able to be more definitive. But I'd like to share an equally important theory, a key or meta-level understanding that causes so much of history to begin to make sense. Two related truths I've encountered time and time and time again in my research. The first is that there seems to be an obvious tradition in Indo-European cultures of sending off the fittest portion of the surplus population to settle or conquer new lands, as hinted at in the opening stanzas of Kipling's White Man's Burden. I believe it's exactly this tradition, which seems to be a mainstay of nearly all Western peoples throughout recorded history, which has caused the radiating outwards of the linguistic, cultural, and genetic element to the furthest lands and shores. They often brought horses, chariots, swastikas or sun wheels, the caste system, and similar religious pantheons and cultural traditions in their wake. In every case, they seem to have formed the ruling or governing class. The second key truth 
is the gradual and inevitable mixing of peoples in these nations over time, especially as the firmly defined caste system was relaxed or broken down completely. These two factors, when considered in concert, provide the only sensible lens through which history suddenly springs to life and makes comprehensible sense. The mental gymnastics modern academics engage in to try to paint each empire and people as entirely distinct and separate is extremely misleading. Well, it seems that most scientists, uh, it's like the status quo and nobody wants to rewrite the history books. You know what I mean? Uh, they, and the way they are taught by their professors that uh, this lineage, it's difficult for them to, to somehow change and, and embrace new theories. Uh, there is one great problem uh, with uh, modern science, which seems to be diminished, but it has ruled uh, the civilized world for half a century. And that is that uh, they uh, discard all evidence one by one, as long as there is no solid proof, one by one. And in that way, they are very often, I think, throwing the baby out with the wash water. Instead of considering the possibility that when you have these many evidences, is it possible that it is a coincidence or is it not? I've long followed several alternative historians and researchers and archaeologists, such as Graham Hancock or Brian Forrester, for example and many do great work. But failing to grasp the extent of the subversion of academia causes them to try hard to force-fit their discoveries into flawed models of the past. And it's important to mention the point of this video isn't to proclaim the greatness of Indo-European peoples or illustrate their history of achievement. And it's certainly not to put down other groups or insult them or cause them to feel inferior. The goal here is to attempt to piece together an accurate and honest portrait of history in an age in which misinformation is completely subverting and rewriting the record. Because this truth matters, and I happen to believe it matters immensely, more so now than ever, and it's difficult to imagine a greater crime than the wholesale rewriting of history. And I want to leave you all with this, and I hope you take it to heart, as it's difficult to overemphasize its importance. Authoring an honest and accurate history is now a responsibility that falls squarely on our shoulders. And please understand what I'm saying here. This really is on us. Modern science and academia filters all historical understanding through a prism of political correctness stemming from this new cult of diversity and tolerance and globalism, which virtually every last one of them now belong to. And those that don't? Well, they're dominated or marginalized by those that do. Moneyed interests finance every archaeological dig, genetic study, every major analysis and research paper on relevant topics. The universities that give grant money for such things only do so when and where the conclusions fit into our present cultural whims. This precludes even the possibility of honest historical research and discussion. As we speak, historical truth is being buried and obfuscated, mischaracterized and misrepresented. Here is the large Buddha. The large Buddha is 175 feet high, probably the biggest in all of the world. And here's what remains of it. The face was cut away many centuries ago when the Muslims took over this area. But there are Hudlin and David at the bottom there to give you an idea of size. And you're looking up 175 feet. And above its head, above the head of this statue, we could see very unusual paintings. We were told it might be possible to go up there and see the paintings at close range. We see the red beard and uh, red hair. It's a shame that these figures have all been defaced by people of other faiths at some time in the past. But it's uh, still, it's very easy to see what they looked like and we can tell who they were. He's got the red beard, uh, red hair parted in the middle. The statues that you've seen, the caves themselves, are 1,500 or more years old. 
And this is a secret way to get to the top of the Buddha that they only recently discovered. The regular way to go up there was long since destroyed, but they're able to get in sort of a back way. Well, we climbed down again, all the way down this way, and had one last look at that magnificent big Buddha, 175 feet high, carved in these cliffs 1,500 years ago. And a great deal of it is being literally disappeared. As artifacts challenging the worldview they seek to impose on us all are either mysteriously misplaced or are destroyed. For those with time and interest, I'm asking you to join the fight here. Explore, research, seek to put the pieces together. I believe our time window is closing, and that time is of the essence. Technology is a double-edged sword here, and can allow for the more efficient uncovering and understanding of our past, or the more efficient burying and obfuscating. Countless websites and videos I'd saved in my notes through these years on these topics are no longer accessible. Several of the most important older books on these topics are now out of print and can cost several hundred dollars on Amazon. The past is disappearing, and the quote, history, end quote, they're offering up in its place is largely an invention out of whole cloth. It's fraudulent and aggressively so. Again, history is informative on the deepest levels. It informs us of who we were, who we are, and who we might someday be. The memory of all those who came before us needs to be honored and preserved. A tree can't survive without its roots. And to best chart our future, we must first understand our past. Let's get to work.